So I'm going to, this is a maze of the talk, okay? It's not a plan, it's a maze. And I'm going to talk about the creativity of metaphor, or the metaphor can have. I'm going to talk about the role of metaphor in creativity. And um, going down to the bottom there, I'm going to talk about how I feel metaphor goes quite a long way beyond analogy. And since analogy is implicated very heavily in creativity, I want to claim that the contribution metaphor can make to creativity is different from the contribution analogy can make. And this then leads to some rather wild con consequences about um, possibility of creative metaphor within the mind itself. And then that leads on to even more general sort of statement of opinion, which may <coughs> sound quite disruptive, at least compared to traditional theory about how the mind works and what its relationship to the world is. Okay, so what is metaphor? Um, I'm calling it here a liquid use of language. I thought of saying conventionally it's a, it's a fluid use of language. Okay, uh, but I thought it would be a bit, a bit more creative and say liquid. And roughly, roughly speaking, it's talking about something as if it were something else or like something else. Usually something that's quite different qualitatively. And we'll see lots of examples later. Um, and usually, again, not always, usually you either think the two things you're putting together in a metaphor are already similar, or you come to think they're similar as a result of looking at the metaphor. So if you, if you for example, were to call your university department, if you work in a university, uh, think of it metaphorically as a dictatorship, then you're bringing together a department and a dictatorship. I'm pleased to say mine is not. <coughs> Um, and very importantly, and this is where uh, metaphor, well, one of the ways in which it becomes very important for AI, um, it's virtually impossible in practice to talk about abstract things without using metaphor in some form. So when we talk about time, we commonly say things like we're rapidly approaching Christmas, or Christmas is galloping towards us. Financial matters, money flows across borders so easily now. A lot of liquid metaphors in, in economics, like liquidity, for one thing. Um, stock prices plummeted, sword, all that sort of thing. Um, when we talk about processes of all sorts, processes in one's life, in relationships, in one's job, whatever it might be, cooking a cake, baking a cake, um, we use metaphor. We say things like the, the people, John and Mary, seem to be going on different paths, taking them further apart, things like that. Because we're talking about abstract things in terms of physical movement. Computing stuffed full of metaphor. I doubt I could find a single technical term in computer science that is not heavily metaphorical. Okay, so it's so a very, very important tool in just ordinary talk we do all the time, especially about abstract matters. Therefore, very important topic for AI people who deal with language to grapple with. Okay, what's creativity? I'll probably offend certain people I can see in the audience here. I just want to make a very rough statement about what creativity is. Uh, being creative is in some way being unusual or unexpected, but also at the same time being effective in some way. Um, it could be effective in just being interesting or pleasing, beautiful, or it could be effective in a more prosaic way of economically expressing something quite subtle. Okay, and that we'll see examples of that as we go along. So that's what <coughs> roughly what I mean by creativity. Um, now, most people... When I say people, I mean ordinary people, but also non-ordinary people like metaphor researchers <laughs> and psychologists who work on, 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 um, on, on metaphor, um, tend to think, very strongly to think of creative metaphor as being a matter of novel pairings of things. So, for example, if you've never heard of a university department being metaphorically likened to a dictatorship, then that will be, strike you as um, a creative metaphor, perhaps. Okay, so that novel putting together of things. Uh, so I will talk a bit about that, but actually most of my work is not about that. So I want to cover that ground first and then go on to something else. And so here's one of the most famous sort of dramatically novel um, metaphors. It's actually, uh, uh, apparently, Lewis Carroll, uh, when he wrote this, um, for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, it was really more of a sort of fantastical riddle. It wasn't meant to be a sort of serious metaphor or simile. 
why is a raven like a writing desk, asked the Mad Hatter. Um, so we might convert that into a different form. We might say a raven is a writing desk. And you say, well, why? Well, why is a raven? You know, how could a raven be a writing desk or be like a writing desk? By the way, um, many metaphor researchers, myself included, they tend to think of simile. So when you say something is like something, it's just one form that metaphor can take. Whereas other people strongly distinguish between <coughs> metaphor and simile. So when I say metaphor, it's going to include simile. And if you don't like that, we can argue about it later. <laughs> Um, okay, so dramatic novel pairing. Now, I looked on, a, on the, the fount of all wisdom, starting with W-I-K-I, and um, about this. And there are answers people have suggested as to this riddle. And um, one of them, they both come with inky quills. <coughs> people below a certain age may not remember that pen quills used to be used as pens. So a bird has quills, feathers, and, and a desk might have pens on it. Um, they both stand on sticks. Um, they both have legs. Okay. So, the people, so how, how can we see some sort of similarity between a, a raven and a desk? Okay. Well, it's very difficult, but you can come up with this sort of thing, which are probably jo quite jokey in their own right. Okay, but actually, if you think a bit harder, you come up with this amazing interpretation by somebody called me. Okay. <laughs> uh, and... Um, if you imagine a particular context, so for example, imagine a, a writer, a uh, Proust or something, very worried about the, you know, his writing, he's feeling his great writing block, okay, and his desk is sitting oppressively in the dark corner of the room. It's a big old fashioned desk, it's oppressive. Um, now, it, bearing in mind that in the context of my perhaps be Edgar Allan, Allan Poe's story about the raven oppressively sitting up in the corner of the room, if you have a context like that, it might be quite natural to say they're both looming in the room. The desk is looming in the room in an oppressive, threatening way, in just the way that a raven might be. Okay. Now, the, the, there are two very, very important points about that. Firstly, that the bringing together, the similarity, if you like, the reason these are bringing together, is a highly contextual matter in this case. It's not to do with the intrinsic similarity, whatever that might means, between a raven and a desk, <laughs> and the same shape or something like that. That's not the point. The point is their psychological effect on somebody else in the situation. Okay, that is the point. Okay. Um, so there are two points. Actually, it's the context forcing you to that sort of interpretation. And then secondly, there's the fact that that sort of interpretation um, does not deal with the intrinsic similarity of a raven and a desk much at all. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, now, just a, a slight um, uh, aside. Uh, when we say a metaphor is creative, that could be either from the point of view of the speaker or the hearer. It might be novel for neither or for both or one and not the other. Um, so I'm not going to attend much to that point, but I'm mainly going to be talking about how things seem to the hearer of a sentence. So, so if something is novel and effective for the hearer, or to some degree novel, then to that degree it's creative as far as the hearer is concerned. Um, I, an interesting example on the radio just this morning, somebody was talking on the nine o'clock program about um, discovering uh, genes for the eye. I don't know if anybody heard this. And there's this gene called um, something 600 or something, which switches on and off other genes, including itself, interestingly. Um, and the, the, the scientist said um, it, it's like a site manager. Okay? This gene is like a site manager in a work. A workshop or something. That's novel as far as I'm concerned, but as far as I know in <coughs> genetics, that's common or garden, you know, said all the time. I just don't know. But for me, it's not. A less dramatic novel pairing, this ghost is a mole. Do you remember this? Do you recall this? Anybody recall this? Encountered it before? Okay. It's weird. Do you feel it's weird, right? Okay. It's actually from Hamlet, early on in the, in the play. And Hamlet, the point is Hamlet's moving around on the castle walls or something like that, and the ghost of his father is underneath him, booming things. Okay. And, but as Hamlet moves around, the ghost moves around underneath him, okay, like, a, like a mole. So it makes perfect sense. In, and actually, um, I've seen many productions of Hamlet. Uh, I've never noticed this consciously. You know, I think I asked my wife, can you come up with a nice, juicy created metaphor, and she mentioned this one because she's a bit of a Shakespeare expert. And it was great. Okay. It's a very unusual pairing of two things, I think. 
Um, by the way, there's another metaphor mixed in here, which adds to the creativity, that of a pioneer, which is the same as a pioneer, which originally meant a military digger. Um, now, very importantly, metaphor arises not just in, all, in uh, language, but in all media of communication and expression. And so many <coughs> theorists use that fact as circumstantial evidence, at least, for the idea that metaphor is fundamental in thought, not in language. It's, it doesn't come from language uh, or pictures or anything like that. It's fundamental in thought, and that's why it comes up in pictures and language. Okay, so the use of metaphor in communication and expression is just a side effect from its use within the mind. Okay, that's a huge theoretical claim in its own right, but I, I do hold to that. And so, in fact, I want to move now to some cases of pictorial metaphor before I go back to linguistic metaphor. And uh, there's a lot of interest now in linguistics in um, both the way metaphor works in pictures, especially in advertising and things like that, and also the way that the pictorial metaphor interrelates with... Um, a, a linguistic metaphor. <laughs> so here you notice that the, the cell bars are cigarettes. <coughs> this is an advertisement against you know, smoking and trying to uh, warning people of the dangers of addiction. So if you get addicted, you're in prison. Is that metaphor? Okay. Um, notice very carefully that, that correlation of addiction with prison is completely familiar and conventional. I mean, all sorts of restrictive states in the world are likened to being in prison. Your job is a jail. Your relationship is a prison. Addiction is a prison. That's very, very common. Okay. What's not common about this is putting cell bars as cigarettes. Cigarettes as cell bars is a different term. Somewhat similarly, but actually importantly different, is this one. <coughs> Smoking kills, where the, where the cigarettes are bullets now. Um, similar message, and it works in a somewhat similar way, um, but I'll comment later on, on, some, on, on some differences here. So, so the novel creative thing here is exploiting the visual similarity of a cigarette and a bullet to, to establish a metaphorical identity of them. So the, cigarette, the bullet actually becomes a cigarette in the picture. Okay. But the idea, of course, that cigarettes lead to death um, all the bu bullets lead to death. I mean, none of that is, 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 is novel. Okay. Um, so bullets, uh, so uh, guns and so on, being like cigarettes and being a source of death, that's not a novel thought. <laughs> okay. What's novel here is, putting to, is making the bullet look like a cigarette. <laughs> okay. This one, um, uh, clarets is something that's meant to stop bad breath. Okay. So you might have to look at this more than two seconds to realize that one of the tongues is a, a fish, presumably a smelly one, and the other tongue is a sock, presumably also a smelly one. <laughs> People here may not be familiar with the phenomenon of smelly socks. Some are. Okay. And uh, so interestingly, <laughs> by the way, you've got two different metaphors of the same thing here. Smelly breath or smelly tongue, I suppose, as something else smelly, like a fish or Sock. Okay. okay, and then finally this, no, not finally, this one um, is meant to give the idea that each person's brain is like a fingerprint, it's individual, and that is brought out and emphasized by this rather spurious visual similarity between what a brain looks like and what a fingerprint looks like. You draw them right and make them the same size. Um, this one is courtesy of me on a little London Midland train back from work one day. Uh, I saw this. It's about Cadbury's world. I'm sorry if it's a bit indistinct. I've got to blow up of it in a second. Um, and Cadbury's world. When I first went to Birmingham, one of the first things I did with my wife and, and daughter was go to Cadbury's world. It's a great place. You do all sorts of things with chocolate. And eat, there's now something they don't do, alas, which is wonderful hot chocolate with chili in it. Aztec chocolate, hot chocolate. Great stuff. Okay. Um, but all sorts of other things you can do. You can play with chocolate and read about chocolate and mess around with chocolate and all sorts of things. And um, but I want to emphasize, I don't know if you can see it properly, but you've got a whole world of chocolatey fun. Okay. Now the world there in the middle is made of chocolate. You've got a chocolate world there, which is the world of fun. Okay. And on the world of fun, there are all sorts of images of things you can do. Okay, let me blow up one of those. Uh, let's go to the next one. 
that one in the middle is very distinct. That actually shows a great thing they have there, which they've got big sort of chocolate beans with ears and eyes, sort of anthropomorphized chocolate beans on a wall. And you've got a big gun which shoots liquid chocolate. And, and you knock the beans off the wall with this liquid chocolate gun. Okay, so that's what, that's a picture of me doing that. Um, great fun. Okay. Now, it's actually a very complicated um, metaphor. In fact, you really start to, to analyze it. It's sort of likening, well, first of all, you've got this metaphor of this abstract um, area or environment in, in Cadbury's world, which is now being likened to an actual globe. And that's very, very common. We think of all sorts of situations as world, as physical world. What's not so common is then putting on that world, <coughs> on the surface of that world, the things you can do in that abstract world. Okay. And also, it's not, it's quite creative <coughs> in the world that's made of chocolate. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. Now, what I want to emphasize now is that there are uh, two types of novel pairing we've seen. In Raven Desk and the Ghost Mole, you could say, at least in, uh, for many interpretations of those, like the, the Raven and the Desk both have legs, so sticks, and the Ghost and the Mole, they both move around under the earth. It really, for those sorts of interpretations, really is the intrinsic similarity. Features of the Ghost match up with features of the Mole. Okay, and that's the point. Okay. Um, so I'm saying here that the, the, the pairing is a direct conduit for the, the message that the pairing and the analogy you do between aspects of one thing and the other, that is, if you like, the message. Whereas, as I was sort of indicating earlier, in the cigarette cell bar case, the pairing is really incidental. So putting the cigarette and cell bar together, you know, equating them in the picture, that's really incidental. Um, what it's meant to do is vividly lead you, remind you of a very familiar pairing of addiction and prison. So interestingly, creative metaphor can involve a novel pairing. But the point of the creativity there is not the novel pairing in itself. It's the fact that it leads to a familiar pair and reminds you of it in a very forceful way. Um, so I've said that there. Um, but now going back to my interpretation, my wonderful interpretation of the Raven desk in a sort of contrived context, um, the point there is that uh, you're likening the emotional effect on someone of the Raven and this writer of the raven and the emotional effect of the desk that is the similarity it's extrinsic to the two things okay and um i'm going to argue later that it's very very common in metaphor. it's actually standard in metaphor that you take a parallel between the emotional qualities of the source like the raven and the emotional qualities of the target that's a standard sort of thing to do in that you map over the emotion between the two okay so that's a standard thing even though raven equals desk is highly novel, what it's actually giving you is completely standard. In other words, it's working through a completely standard um, um, sharing of emotion. Okay, now going back to those pictures, I just want to emphasize a couple of things there. Um, it, there's quite a lot of subtle things going on. And it's amazing, by the way, how we absorb these things and understand them, and, and an ordinary person does. I mean, the, the advertisement in the London Midlands train is not meant to be for a metaphor researcher. <laughs> It's meant to be even an ordinary brummy, or somebody who's just come to start living in Birmingham, an ordinary person, okay? not a metaphor, not a strange metaphor. Okay. The point is, it's getting over that fun is intrinsically chocolatey. Okay, it's got this world of fun, it's made of chocolate. Okay, it's not just sort of somehow likening fun to playing with chocolate or something. Fun is chocolate. Okay. Um, and then secondly, the smelly tongues, the two people are interacting, they're breathing at each other, and presumably each one thinks the other one has a smelly breath, not realizing he or she, him or herself, has smelly breath. Okay. Um, and then the cigarettes is prison. There's a very subtle thing here that mostly, stereotypically, people don't intend to go to prison. So in that first advertisement, there's a sort of unintentionality that you will end up in addiction if you're not careful. Okay. Whereas with the second one, presumably, one could discuss this, but presumably when talking about the person is using a gun on themselves, right? It's not somebody else shooting at them with cigarettes. They are shooting at themselves with cigarettes. Okay? And presumably, normally when you shoot yourself with a gun, it's, I mean, it might be accidental, but I mean, pointed at yourself. That's fairly intentional. At least you should have known. 
that something dangerous might happen if you do something like that. So that's completely opposite on the grounds of intention. Okay, it's saying, you know, you, you damn well ought to know that if you play around with cigarettes, you're going to get hurt. So quite subtle connotations of those two different metaphors. Okay, now, I'm going to move away now from this novel pairing idea, because people have argued, I think, persuasively, that actually novel pairing is just a minority of the case of, of actual creative metaphors. And people have looked at poetry, even in poetry, even in the most wonderfully metaphorical poetry, mostly creativity comes not out of putting new things together, but of taking old ways of putting things together and exploiting them in new ways, elaborating an existing metaphorical pairing, if you like. And also mixing metaphors together is another great tool for, for creativity. So I, I go further in this direction and also... Uh, I, didn't, I forgot to mention right at the beginning, I've developed an AI system that deals with uh, the sort of met reasoning you need to do to understand the sort of creative metaphor I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I put this all into an operational context from an actual computer program that does the sort of processing I'm going to be talking about. But I'd like now to go to, I don't want to talk about poetry. I don't want to talk about ravens and desks or ghosts being moles and all that stuff. Okay. I want to go to a mundane example. Okay. To my undying shame, I once picked up in a supermarket this very cheap, both literally and metaphorically, romance magazine full of teenagers swooning over each other or failing to swoon over each other. And uh, um, this wonderful passage. I mean, look how full of metaphor it is. All the red stuff is, I would claim, metaphorical. The underlined ones are relatively creative. The non-underlined ones are pretty conventional, like play with fire, feeling empty or cold, and that type of thing. Um, but this thing about the words, how could he, how could he, you know, go off with another girl or something, uh, jumping about her weary brain. Now, actually, it's quite common to talk about ideas as animate beings. So we talk about ideas <coughs> lurking in the mind or attacking one. So that's common. Um, it's, one sees instances of, 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 of ideas and thoughts jumping about people's minds or brains. You can look on the web and find examples of that. But I have yet to find an example, an other example of where you've got words jumping around in somebody's brain. Okay, I've heard of stories jumping around, things like that, but not a particular set. Oops. Oh. This is something I'm doing. Um, anyway, I can carry on talking about it. Um, the... Uh, so that's pretty novel. And then there's another thing you may notice there about a voice shouting in her ear. Actually, if you, again, if you look at actual language use, you'll find plenty of examples of when people, there's a slightly unpleasant or an unexpected message for somebody. It's often portrayed as being something shouted in their ear. Okay. <laughs> I must have a strange effect on this <laughs> technology here. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... That, uh, I would say, sort of moderately creative metaphorical usages. Um, what was next? I've actually got my... Another example, again, from extremely mundane language that I, I happened to come across while looking for something else. There are all these wonderful <laughs> websites of blogs about what's wrong with your car and how to fix it or how you'll never be able to fix it. And, and so people showing off their expertise about this and that model or you need exactly this part to fix that particular engine and all that stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in that, but I am interested in the metaphor there. And there's a great thing about my car thinks it's on holiday. That's actually not that unusual. Uh, in fact, you'll find hotel advertisements that say, when you come to our hotel, your car gets a holiday too. Things like that. So that's quite common. But then it went on to say, it's got very confused. Perhaps because of all my uh, All my wares are laid out in <laughs> Um So uh, that... Uh, 
thing about being confused by the cold weather or something, and then perhaps um, I'm not sort of yeah. And, and then we confuse our cars into thinking they're tall but horizons, which I think is some sort of low, mean sort of car, okay, um, which doesn't work very well. So this is a great sort of creative elaboration on actually quite common thought that when a car isn't working very well, it's on holiday or doesn't want to work. Or, you know, it's a lot of anthropomorphization of cars. They don't want to, it doesn't want to start. It doesn't want to accelerate, things like that. Okay. This is a creative elaboration of that common Okay. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, people have studied you know, uh, metaphor a lot, and they found that you know, 90, 95% of all metaphorical usages in actual language are just conventional, standard phrases like this at the back of somebody's mind in the corner or something like that. That's all very common. Okay. So you could say in an AI system, for example, or as a psychological model of the mind, you could do 95% of the job just by having millions of phrases like that just stored with their their meanings about the world stored, okay? Actually, it's not quite as easy as that because actually the meaning of these things is pretty subtle in some cases. <coughs> it's not quite clear what their meaning really is. But at least they're fixed phrases, which is a good start. The trouble is that they can be productively, in other words, creatively elaborated in, in a completely free way with no particular bounds to it. So you do see things like in a dim corner, a dim corner or something, like, not just in a corner, that emphasizes the inaccessibility of the idea, um, or its hiddenness, um, in a distant corner, etc. Okay, you can elaborate like that. And you, can do, you can qualify the corner with any way you like, that in real life, if, if a qualification of a corner in real life would make it darker or more distant or or um, more difficult to get things out of it and, and stuff like that. Anything like that about real corners can be applied metaphorically. There's no restriction as to what language you might use here. So there are no fixed phrases in there. There's a fixed core, but then it can be productively varied. I thought I was inventing cobwebby corner of the mind, but then as in, any metaphor researcher should immediately do when they think they've invented something is go onto a search engine and they will find examples of it. But I only found about eight examples on, on the web of, of um, talking about the corner of one's mind being cobwebby. Um, so that's relatively creative, probably. But notice the subtlety. What does that convey? I mean, dirty, right? Dirty corner. Um, undesirable. But notice subtly probably has not been visited in a long time. Cobwebs only grow in places where you, which aren't, don't get disturbed. So it's not just that the corner has a hidden idea in it or an inaccessible idea. It's been like that for a long time. Okay, notice all that you get out of that one word. Um, okay. Uh, now, um, just what I, I want to introduce here, really, the term open-ended elaborations, that this jumping about her weary brain, the words doing so, it's an open-ended sort of elaboration of the normal notion of an idea as an animate entity. Um, and, and one could have millions of things like that. There's no bound to what you could talk about ideas doing once you grasp that they are animals or something. They can jump and leap and bite you and follow you and hide from you and spit on you if they're yamas and that sort of thing. Okay. The idea was buried in the outback of, of Cape Mine. Again, I sort of invented that. There are some instances on the web. Um, but it's a relatively creative version of saying something like it's buried in the recesses of his mind or in a corner of his mind. Mind. Um, outback, what does it do? It emphasizes the um, inaccessibility, doesn't it? Australian outback, difficult to get out there. It might even be dangerous. Okay. So it's especially hidden and inaccessible and dangerous to get. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. The third one here about the strings, that's a real thing I heard on the radio. I don't think strings are attached. This is about, this is an African politician talking about Chinese investment in, in mining in Africa. And so the politician was saying, I don't think strings are attached to this deal, this investment. If there are any, they're made of nylon. I can't see them. Okay. Um, now, I have not been able to find any other instance of talk of strings that are metaphorically describing constraints being made of nylon. Okay, that seems a very creative thing. And it very nicely gets at the idea that, that um, you can't see these strings. Or if they are there at all, you can't see them, or it's difficult to see them. But, more so, it makes it out that it's the strings' fault you can't see them. You know, it's not the politician's fault. 
right? That's very important. If you just said, I can't see any strings, you say, oh, well, stupid you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but because the strings are made of nylon, oh, of course you can't see them. Um, OK, again, from the radio, a lot of examples come from the radio. Radio 4 is a great source of metaphor. OK. Um, since the problem is something about the regulation of back, we all know how all this regulation they promise is all going to evaporate. Okay. So it seems to be kicked right over the long grass into the junkyard down the road. Okay. Appealing to the common conception of kicking something into the grass. It's not this one over the grass, not even in the grass, it's beyond the grass into a junkyard. What's the significance of that? It's now junk, and not only that, you can't get it back. Okay. If you go to a junkyard and try to pick up some junk, there's a big burly guy there who's going to talk to you about that. You can't get it out of the junkyard. This one's interesting. The weather is settling into a dry, the original example was into a drier frame of night. Okay. Notice this is not saying the weather is necessarily becoming drier. Just as when you say somebody's in a generous frame of mind, you're not saying they're being generous on any particular occasion. You're just saying they have a sort of tendency to be, on any given occasion, to be generous. Okay. You know, other things being equal, they might be inclined to be generous towards you. Similarly here, the weather is going to have a tendency to be dry. Um, so it's actually quite a subtle message. And then I looked on um, the web and so on and found four other similar examples. And one was benevolent frame of mind, fickle frame of mind, bipolar frame of mind, <laughs> uh, and some other more ridiculous I can't remember. Um, notice that's a creative elaboration of the notion of weather being in a frame of mind, <coughs> the memory, fickle frame of mind, that, it, that extends that notion of the weather having a mind at all. Okay. Of course, the weather being a person, being personified or deified, goes back to the beginnings of human civilization. Okay. But talking about the weather having a benevolent frame of mind does not go back to the beginnings of, or even back to the beginnings of Google. Okay. okay. Um, now, very importantly, my claim is that in order to understand these sentences, typically, not always, but typically, you do not have to create more analogy. Okay? When somebody talks about the outback of somebody's mind, you're not being asked to find something about Katie's mind that can be likened to her outback. Oh, I know, it's that particular part of her mind or something. You're not being asked to do that. The only point of the outback is to work within a fantasy scenario where you imagine this idea being buried in an Australian outback and therefore inaccessible and difficult to get at. Okay, that's all the outback is doing. It's not saying there's a part of Katie's mind that is like an outback. That's completely missed the point if you thought about it. Okay. Um, similarly with the nylon, a bit more subtly, um, you're not being asked to sort of think about what is it exactly in the con abstract constraint in this investment plan that corresponds to nylon? What is the nylon? You know, what's the link there? And what is, what's the relationship of being made of something, whatever it might be? Is that, does that parallel something in the world of constraints? No, that's not the point. The nylon is only there to imply lack of visibility in the physical sense. And then there's a famous metaphor whereby being aware of something is likened to physically seeing it. Okay? That's absolutely sounds one of the most famous metaphorical pairings. So again, we've got this creative metaphor that actually rests on a completely standard pairing of things. Um, and then similar points can be made down here, a bit more stuff I won't, I won't go through. The, so the mental states underlying fickleness, for example, don't have any parallel in the weather. The only point is that if somebody is fickle, they flip between different behaviours. That's the point. Okay. You're not being asked to, to come up with some theory of the weather where there's a nice analogy between things going on in the weather and mental states. Okay. That would be completely missed the point. Okay. So, these non-parallel things, these things that don't have an analogical correspondence, that sit in the metaphor of the source scenario, like the outback, are only there to generate consequences that do have a parallel. And the parallel, typically is actually via standard parallel, standard analogies that you already know. Okay. Not by some new thing you have to work out. That's the point. Okay. And there's an, a nice, uh, yet another example of this I've often used, I particularly like it, um, from uh, 
Nick Hornby novel, as many of you may know. Uh, somebody's talking about, I, I shouldn't criticize Phil too much, but it became unavoidable. When Jackie expressed doubts about him, I had to nurture those doubts. Okay. They grew from tiny sickly kitchens, sorry, chickens, <laughs> kitchens, whatever, into sturdy, healthy grievances. Okay. With their own cat flaps. Love to wander in and out of our conversation. Obviously, this is a very, very, you know, thought out, warped, creative, artistic metaphor. Okay. But the interesting point about it is you're not being asked to liken cats to grudges or grievances in any significant way. You're not trying to find, okay, what's the, you know, a cat has legs and a tail and whiskers. What, what does that correspond to in a grievance? Okay. You're not asked to do that. Okay. You're not asked to find what it is about conversations that can be likened to cat flaps. Okay. The point of the cat flaps is to emphasize merely that the cats are coming in and out independently of their own will. So it's as if the grievances are coming in and out of the conversations of their own will. And therefore, they're not coming in and out because of the will of the conversational participant. So it's a denial of responsibility for bringing these conversation, these grievances into and out of the conversation. Very subtle metaphor, got at by this notion of the grievances as cat, cats. Okay, and even the catness, okay, catness is an element. I mean, you know, any animal that went in and out of its own will, and probably opossums do the similar thing. Okay, it wouldn't matter. Um, okay, so here's a, a, a how many more minutes have we got? Wow. Am I under the end? Yeah. I'm at the end. Towards the end. How towards? Well, as you've been severely uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. put right. out, I right. think you should finish when you within the next 10 minutes. Then. Oh, 10 minutes, that's good. Okay. Um, big message from, from this, going back to this idea that metaphor occurs in the mind, in fact, that's the foundation of metaphor, all of what I've said applies just as much to metaphor within the mind as it does to metaphor in language or pictures or whatever. Okay. So... Open-ended elaboration of familiar analogies can happen within the mind. Okay. So you can have a creative thought that rests on this sort of open-ended extension of a metaphor in the mind, but not extending the analogy, just rather fantastically extending the source scenario, bringing in cat flaps or outbacks or nylon and all that stuff. Bringing that in doesn't have any analogical correspondence in things in the, the real-world situation you're actually thinking about. Okay. Um, and so, and further, I'd like to take from this that you should not think, it's sort of part of the, saying the same thing, you should not think of the source scenario, like this thing with the cats and the cat flaps and so on, as each part of it having a message about the real situation discussed. It's more that the whole scenario holistically conspires together to convey certain messages. Okay, And any particular message you get out of the source scenario and apply it to the real situation, that comes from a collaboration of all sorts of stuff within the source scenario. And you can't necessarily give responsibility for that message to any particular part of the scenario. Now, what this means is that when you're thinking in this creative metaphorical way, you could be thinking about a Katie's mind in terms of an Australian outback and never cashing out what that means literally. Okay, so in other words, the thought that there's, her mind is like an Australian outback, or rather, you're thinking of her mind as if it contained an Australian outback, contains ineradicably metaphorical aspects to it. There is no translation for... The idea of the of an idea being in that outback, okay. and that, it's a holistic thing. It's the whole scenario has some sort of weak translation about inaccessibility of the idea <laughs> of that. And then, uh, so this also then say, okay, well, this doesn't apply just to to metaphor. There's no particular reason to think that when we have thoughts in our mind, that each individual thought itself. So even, sorry, I'm, I'm imagining somebody thinking about a real-world situation or a possible real-world situation. They're not just dreaming or daydreaming or inventing fantasies in their mind. They're actually trying to think about the world. Um, the, the, you, it is a mistake to think that each thought in the complex of thoughts you're having 
actually represent something in the world. It's a much more holistic thing than that. They conspire together to have a message about the world where that message may not have a, be able to be assigned responsibility to any particular thought that you're, one thought that you're having. And the same applies to sentences, by the way. There's this sort of traditional idea that you have a discourse, you've got sentences in it. Classical thing to do. In fact, I mean, almost everybody thinks this way. Each sentence has a meaning about the topic of discussion. Okay, you say, what is the meaning of this sentence? What is the meaning of that sentence? What is the meaning of this sentence? And then you put those meanings together to get a meaning for the discourse. I think that's completely wrong. Okay. I think sentences conspire together holistically to have meaning, and that meaning cannot necessarily be isolated and, and blamed on any one sentence. So to speak. I mean, there are case, simple cases when individual sentences do have their own meaning. And the same, exactly the same point applies to thought. That's the, the idea I'm trying to get over. Um, uh, okay, I've just got, if I've just got a little bit more time, I'll just talk very briefly about my at meta, so-called at meta AI approach to metaphor. I'll just say a few words about it. I don't want to give you technical, loads of technical stuff about it. It's based on a notion of pretenses or fictions, and I list there some correspondences in the world of metaphor theory, other people who think on, on, on similar lines. Um, and so, uh, let me go to this. The idea is, we go back to this outback example, the idea is you create a pretense or fiction <coughs> in which Katie's mind really does contain a physical outback. The idea is a physical object which is really buried somewhere in this outback. Okay, so you create this fantastical scenario in a pretense. Or, actually, I prefer the word fiction now. I think fiction gets the point over very well. It's a story. Um... And then the point is, in that fiction, just as we do in an ordinary fiction like Sherlock Holmes or something, we make inferences from what we're told about the, the world of that fiction. Equally with the outback, you make inferences like that the idea is physically hidden to Katie. It's currently physically unmanipulable by Katie. She can't actually manipulate it right now. But more than that, it would be difficult and time-consuming for her to go and physically manipulate it. And could it be dangerous for her to do it? So that's all inferences you, you develop within this fiction. So to put it pictorially, I've forgotten I'd animated this, I'm sorry. Let's go, let me put everything in. I was going to go through this sequentially, but there isn't time. Okay, so um, you've got the thing at the top that J is meant to be simple just for the idea that's being talked about. It's buried in the outback of her mind. You infer from that that J is a physical object because only physical objects can be buried. You infer also that Katie's mind is a physical ter terrain because only physical terrains could have a physical outback. And from all that, you infer that the idea J is physically hidden to Katie's conscious self. There's a technical detail there I won't go into. Um, not physically manipulable, manipulable by Katie, basically, um, etc. The things I said on the previous slide. And the point is that if you know one metaphorical correspondence here, that um, physical manipulation in this way of talking corresponds to mental usage. So when you talk about physically manipulating an idea, you're talking about mentally using it. That is the basic metaphor going on. If you know that one little piece of, very general piece of analogy, that enables, uh, plus some other stuff I mentioned in a second, that enables you to extract by those green arrows things that K... Katie cannot mentally use the idea in reality. Okay, that's the real point. Katie would find it difficult to mentally use the idea because of that green arrow there. Okay. Now the point there is, I claim that there are sort of standard um, things that map over, like difficulty maps over, standardly a metaphor. Whatever the metaphor is about, time, money, marriage, atoms, universal departments, whatever it might be, if there's difficulty in the source about something, then there's difficulty in the target about the corresponding thing in the target. If there is a corresponding thing in the target. So uh, there would be difficulty. And the wouldness, uh, the, the hypotheticality that maps over as well. So it would be difficult to be manipulable physically in the fiction. Therefore, it would be difficult for Katie to mentally use the idea. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that, that carry, all that carryover by the green arrows is based on, on completely standard long-term knowledge you have about metaphor. 
Okay, it's nothing to do with Australian outback. You don't need any new analogy to handle. Um, okay, so a sort of take-home message for, for that is, oops, wants to send you home, I think. <laughs> it doesn't matter, I'll just say it. <laughs> no, sorry, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm about, about to end. Um, so the, the point is um, that there's a lot of metaphor theory out there which rests on analogy. Okay? And almost always people who base their theory of metaphor on analogy think that the job you have to do when you meet a metaphorical utterance that doesn't fit analogies you already know, goes beyond them in some way. Your job is to extend analogies or create a new analogy. Find new analogical linkages between the stuff that's new and stuff in the real world. Okay. I say that's completely wrong. What you should be doing is trying to exploit your existing analogies as far as you possibly can by doing a lot of rich inference in terms of this fiction, this rich fiction which has a merely holistic relationship to the reality and not some piece-by-piece -piece relationship to reality. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.